Hi Tina A. Wake here for the litmus test. This is our last episode, the literature episode, and I'm here with local author John Archer. He's a non-fiction author and from Pearl Beach. Thanks for having us today, John. It's a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank Do you, you want to tell coming. us how you started? Um, well, principally, I started because I wanted to build my own house uh, down in Malakuta in, in Gippsland, and we did, had very little money. Uh, and I figured that the only way we could do that was to actually make the bricks, build the whole house ourselves from scratch. I didn't realise how hard that was going to be, but I read a lot of books I got on mud brick construction and on how to build your own house. I accumulated a lot of books to help me through the process of building, and, and I found those books, most of them, very useful. Uh, but I found the actual making of mud bricks and laying of mud bricks, building mud brick walls, is a very simple process. And it was fabulous. It made me a very healthy man. I think I was very unhealthy before I started doing all that work. So when the house was finished, a lot of people came to ask how we did it. And I got the flu and I was confined to a caravan by my family for two days. And I wrote the book then when I had the flu. Um, I, I looked for a publisher and I found a publisher in Victoria who had uh, published a similar book on mud brick. So I went to see them. They bought it immediately, gave me an advance, and I went home with, with the check in my pocket. So that was my first book and my first publisher. Which was how long ago? 1976. Wow. Um, or 1975, sorry, published in 1976. And uh, from that time on, the, the book took on a life of its own. I, I wrote stuff for Rolling Stone. I wrote stuff for magazines all over the place. I was fascinated by doing articles on mud brick. I, I became a mud brick fanatic. I became a mud brick bore, probably, to some people. But uh, in the process of that, I, I, I'd sort of written quite a lot of stuff. And so the book sold really well. It, it sold thirty or 40,000 copies, which was put me on the Mike Walsh show, you know, the Today Show with Jeannie Little, we're making mud bricks, that sort of stuff. Um, that helped sell books. Definitely the midday show and and Alan Jones I've been on and, and Alan Jones sells books. You know these people do. Um, getting back to that, that, so that was my first book, and and that uh, that came as an enormous surprise that it would do so well. Uh, the second book I became fascinated by indigenous architecture after mud brick. Then you start to look around the world and think, what have all these people done with mud bricks? So I did a big book called Improvisations, a big hardcover book which they only printed 2,000 of, and it's now a rare book. Um, that was my, my sort of, I wanted that to be an, uh, an inspiration for people who were building. Saying, look, we don't have to build really boring, square, rectangular houses that we want to on sell to somebody else in the future. Why don't we build works of art that we live in? Why, why don't we build... I've been around artists for a long while, you know, I, I, I was an artist, I stopped being an artist, I've become an artist again. Um, but, you know, a lot of artists build really creatively. They, they don't want to, they think about the real estate value of what they're doing. And I was encouraging people to think like that because we unnecessarily get into mortgages because we don't understand how simply and cheaply we can live. And what we're doing is selling our future. Uh, and that was... I mean, I learnt that from reading Thoreau, like the books that, that caused me so much or offered me so much inspiration. Thoreau was one, Henry Thoreau's Walden, because it talks about possessions, it talks about mortgages, it talks about how we don't have to do this, and that had never occurred to me before. So it was a new idea. But that carried me through the whole building of the house thing where we got out of that without a mortgage at all. We bought things very cheaply. We, we went to sales of building materials. We bought half a bridge that was being demolished and used these enormous timbers for the doorways and things. So the house was, is, still exists, a work of art, but uh, we, we no longer own it. Um, okay, so then I did a couple of books. And, and then there was a third book. I can't remember. So many books now. Uh, I mean, I remember what it was. It was called the, the Owner Builder's Companion, I think, for Grassroots Magazine. Because um, I'd written a lot for Earth Garden and Grassroots and the Alternative Magazines and Simply Living as well. Um, so I suppose I built a bit of a readership through 
the people who read your articles, like I read someone's article, I'm fascinated by what they're saying and I think they've got more knowledge. I want to read their book, you know. So uh, I was grateful for the fact that, that so many people had, had supported my books in that sense. Um, I also was fascinated then by the history of Australian architecture, right? So we're moving now. Where's the history come from? Where do our, our ideas about housing in Australia which are so many of them inappropriate. We have really bad design in a lot of our, the periods of housing, particularly from the 1830s, 40s, 50s. There's a lot of really bad architecture. And, and where did that come from? So I, I started a history and the Bicentennial Authority uh, gave me a, a grant to continue and that became the book for the Bicentennial Architecture in 1988. Um, and that led me into writing about the history of architecture and then the history of things. I did a book uh, which I'm most proud of. Um, and that's essentially, it's out of print now, uh, but, but that, I did the history of everything. The history of the stove, everything in the house, the history of windows. Where did windows come from? Where did doors come from? Where did linoleum come from? Who invented linoleum and why? What was wrong with ordinary floors, etc. So. The, the, the obsession with history I carried through into the magazine we started in 1980. We, we, by then, the, the whole thing about people building their own houses had become a sort of movement, uh, I suppose a offshoot of the hippies of some sort of sense. A lot of people in communities which I visited were all building their own houses, often very simple. Um, ours was much more conventional because we had to comply with building regulations at that time. So a lot of owner builders didn't want to comply with building regulations. They wanted to build works of art, but the, the councils wouldn't let them. So we started a movement to free up the building regulations, to confront the government, not in a, in a, a heavy sense, but to negotiate, if you like, with the government about the rights of people to build what they want on their own land if they're not in an urban situation. If you're in the country and you've got 100 acres, why the hell can't you build what you want? I met a guy in northern New South Wales. The council told him he couldn't build whatever it was he wanted. So he had an artificial lake put on his property and then he put a houseboat on that and on that houseboat he built the house he wanted and he didn't have to have any permit at all because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what I'm saying is that there are always lateral thinkers and I hope that, that most of my life I've been one, there are always lateral thinkers that can see another way out of the problem, you know, where people just see the wall confronting them, lateral thinkers go around the wall. Uh, and that's been helpful to me in my dealings with bureaucracy and, and government in my life. Um, okay, so moving on from, from the history uh, of all of that, uh, I was away for a while um, researching mermaids. I got into mermaids. I had a, a uh, I can't talk much about that, but I, I was sent to Guam. My last architecture job was to look at the stone ruins of some of these islands in the northern Pacific. Um, there are pyramids there that are amazing. There's a city there built into the sea, 65 acres of stone, the Venice of the Pacific built in two, about 2,000 years ago, and I really wanted to go there. And a magazine paid me to go there. So I went there to take the photos, do the story, and in the course of that, I, I, I climbed a mountain that was there in order to get some photos, and something magical happened. Um, it was as if God spoke to me. It was like, and I'm not a Christian. I'm not a scientist. I'm not anything really. I, don't, I didn't believe in, in extraterrestrial phenomena or any other sort of phenomena. I, I didn't have any brief with any religious thought at all. Uh, everything was purely material. I was a very material, I saw things in material terms. And, and I was deeply touched by, by this voice that seemed to appear from the sea. Now, it is my own hallucination, I have no idea. But when I came back to uh, Australia, I couldn't write any more about building. I seemed to be obsessed with water. And uh, a magazine then, coincidentally. This is why I think sometimes your fate seems to unfold for you. You don't actually 
There's some great Chinese philosopher said you need do nothing. It will all open up. But, you know, we push all the time. We push our, our ideas. We, we, we become ambitious and it's our ambition that propels us into professions we don't want to do, half of us. And, and that, I, I keep thinking you need do nothing. Um, sometimes that's what you end up doing. Um, but a magazine in Melbourne asked me if I'd come and edit them. As in my experience as editor and publisher of the owner builder, they had said our editor's going, do you want to do... So, and they were a plumbing magazine. So I said, yeah, sure. So I did the first edition on water and I, I, I had a budget to get experts. I could talk to anybody I wanted and uh, the magazine paid. So I got very interested and fascinated with water and then I thought the public need a book about water. They, they've got to know that the water that's coming through their pipes is not particularly clean or safe half the time. And a lot of the bugs we get come through the pipes and we don't even know. To, we should be filtering our water. So I wrote a little book and I took it to, I, I've worked with six major publishers. I don't have an agent. I, I negotiate myself with publishers. And so I change them and I don't, I don't have contracts that compel me to go with, go my next work with a publisher. I mean, many people, when you sign a contract, they want first option on your next book. But anyway, I, I took it round to all and they said, no, no, it won't sell. Won't sell won't so I thought I'd, I'd print it myself. I'd done the magazine. I, I knew printers. I, I, I know the process of publishing. So I put the book together and uh, I put my last dollar in. And I think, you know, about 10,000 bucks was, I did a big print run. I, <laughs> I can't believe it now. Um, I did 10,000 copies. Uh, because our magazine used to run to five or six, and I thought, oh. So I went to a friend of mine who, who has a chain of bookshops, and I showed him my new book, and I said, what do you think of this? And he said, hmm, how many will it sell? He said, maybe 10 here. <laughs> anyway, I sold 50,000. Wow. Of that book, and it made me a lot of money because uh, Blackmore, Black, Blackmore, isn't it? The, the, the herbal people. Blackmore's bought $30,000 worth in one hit. People bought my books at that stage in the water industry because they thought that it, that they gave, one chapter of them, gave a message about water filters that they commercially profited from. And so it, it, it seemed to them sensible to buy my books and give them away, which Blackmore's did, which Amway did, which quite a lot. So I had, I was deluged with orders and, and these people don't want wholesale, you can give them whatever price you like, you know. So uh, they paid near retail prices for boxes. I used to walk by the crate, I would only sell them 50 or 60 at a time. Um, they went into editions, you know. So gradually I started doing more books on more issues to do with water because as new things cropped up in the water industry and new technology and new science taught us things about water that we didn't know before, um, about chlorination and, and the problems with chlorination, about various you know technical stuff that I won't go into here. But I felt like what I'd done with the building books was to simplify the process so anyone could read it. Because I left school at 16 and, and I'm, I'm purely self-educated, I would like people to be able to read my work like me, people like me. And if I can understand it, I can communicate that understanding to my readers. So, so the water books were an extension in, your way, in a way of, of the building book. Uh, in the middle of that, I came back to, from, uh, I went overseas for a while, and I came back to a controversy between the alternative medical scene and the doctors. And it was about an alternative cancer conference that was held in Darling Harbour. All the doctors rallied round to rubbish this and talk about how, how alternative medicine and Chinese traditional medicine, all this stuff was crap. And I got very angry um, I, because a lot of my friends are, are in the, the profession of, of alternative medicine. And I felt that this was really grossly unfair. But not only that, uh, doctors, a lot of what doctors do is not underwritten by science. It's, it's really the information they get from pharmaceutical companies, the information that they pass among themselves. Some, some of this is very flawed, you know. Um, and many drugs and many 
uh, treatments that, that have been labelled safe have afterwards been found to kill heaps of people. You know, you don't have to go very far to find examples of drugs and treatments that have been withdrawn because they've been proved fatal in the long run. So I wrote a book about medicine. I decided that I would write a book which pointed out the failures of modern medicine, just as they've been trying to point out the failures of alternative medicine. And uh, that was a very difficult book to write because I had to really uh, learn to understand medicine. So I had to do a crash course in medicine to criticise it. And, and fortunately, there are a lot of anonymous whistleblowers among the medical profession and at, even at university level who helped me and lawyers. Uh, I worked with the, some of the, the, the top uh, medical negligence lawyers. Uh, people incredibly. Anyway, okay, so I put that together and then Who Weekly gave it a good write up when it first came out and, and that sold. So, you know. It sounds medicine, like your obsessions change. To well, go from there was a to brief water. obsession. I am still obsessed with medicine because I'm back to diabetes now, but I, I, I've come to uh, have a great distrust on the whole of the medical profession, you know because because my, various of my relatives died as I result of medical overcare. Anyway, that's just my personal bugbear. To get back to publishing, what, what I'd like to say was when I started self-publishing in, in uh, 1990, 19, yeah, 1990, 91, um, the bookshops weren't that crowded. The big blockbusters weren't holding all the space. You could get your books as a self-published author could get space if you went through a distributor. Um, I had a very good distributor who's now gone bankrupt, um, not owing me any money, fortunately. But now there is no real distributor for people wanting to publish. And th these are major issues that you don't think about in the excitement of publishing your own work, um, is how are you going to sell it? So my father, on the other hand, I think envious of, of my literary output, um, wrote his own book. And he, he uh, did that with a vanity publisher, right? So you pay them a lot of money, you, you get a book in the end, hardcover, photographs, the lot. And, and the bookshop sold about eight or nine. And he had 2,000. So he went on tour through Queensland and sold them all. Um, <laughs> He went on radio. I mean, we're an old grazing family in Queensland. We've been there since 1853. We, we, a lot of our properties are all over the place and we founded Rockhampton in 1853. Um, so we're not unknown in Queensland. But anyway, he said, there you are, sold the lot. So it's possible even to publish with vanity publishers uh, who, who will do everything for you for a, quite a considerable fee and, and present you with a finished book. It's still possible to sell those, but can you sell them at a competitive price? You know, it's all very well with the distributor. The distributor wants about, in total, uh, around 40 or 50 percent of the retail price. So you end up getting, and if, you, if your books cost X amount to print, you have to do all this stuff. We fortunately have been able to do that through the magazine. We learnt about the budgets, about how to cost things so that you do make a profit and, and what the, how that discipline works. Um, so I think that publishing now has become far more difficult, self-publishing. And the big publishers are even worse. The big publishers, the major publishers, uh, won't easily look at the first time writer unless there's some big blurb going on or they've managed to engage a literary agent. I mean, I've dealt with that, no agents. I, I've never had an agent. And I've always dealt directly with publishers, but now you couldn't. I couldn't get into the offices that I got into then and, and talk with the CEO of the business. Um, but back then they were, in, they were bored. People at the top, ministers. I mean, I, I dealt with three cabinet ministers and I find they're always bored. They're up in this office. They've got all these menials doing things, but they're actually bored. And, and they'll see you pretty quickly if nothing's on. Um, so I found that was easy. I could take my proposals into publishers and have them uh, dealt with fairly expediently. And Oxford University Press even. I, mean, I met the head of Oxford University Press. He came up to Malakuta. He was in looking at our house. And uh, I wanted to do a book for children on... I forgot about the children's book. Um, 
Did I press the, the right positive. button? I, I'm sorry. I'm, where are we? Let's make sure we're not. Oh, you're going to have one That's long phone call. <laughs> no, one, no one can get through. Okay. Do you know much about on-demand publishing? Um, at, when I was at the Brisbane Writers' Festival, the two of us talked about publishing. So the online publishing and, and the you know, print-on-demand people were, were on the same panel together. So I got to know them a bit and I have referred other prospective writers to uh, a company in Queensland, whose name I escapes me at the moment, but um, there are now quite a, a proliferation of on-demand publishers. On-demand seems to work well for academics because, you know, if I'm a, a lecturer in, in botany or whatever and I have written a textbook, I can just say I've got 30 students, I want 30 copies and it's going to cost you X amount. They're in that sort of situation and much of the on-demand publishing has been done by academics or they need 10 books to impress their university, whatever. Um, I, I don't think for writers, for original writers, for novels, stuff like that, I don't think it's a very good idea. Um, digital. Digital is something else again. I mean, people are... See, I, I'm a Neo-Luddite. I still write by hand everything. Um, and, and so I'm not, I didn't want part of the digital revolution. Um, but I know that people are doing their own, and you can set your whole book up and all that stuff. Uh, my son actually does a lot of my stuff, and, and we've done our own books before. He, he did all my production of my water books because he worked in a magazine. The magazine gave us all this kind of experience of design, of, of uh, economics, of uh, essentially photography. I became a fairly competent photography a photographer um, and uh, one f exhibition has gone around the world it's been shown in Paris and, and New York and they were my architectural photographs f for a particular project I was doing anyway that's beside the point of, of well that publishing. magazine went for 35 years did you say it's still going still going still yeah. very popular mm. they've gone to color now they've got much more expensive um, <laughs> we, we were black and white back in the days of black and white but I had no photographer. We did everything in-house. So we created the whole thing. We even, like a lot of owner builders, would write us stories about their experiences and they'd be so badly written that I'd rewrite them. And, and I rewrite them in, in the language I thought was really you know, appropriate to that person. So I get into that, the mindset of that and I'd rewrite the article. And they were so thrilled. They never remembered what they actually wrote. <laughs> and so uh, it polished our magazine. We didn't, we didn't publish things always as they came in. We, we, we edited and sometimes altered. But, uh, and we def often didn't have time to ask for consent. But most people never realised that, that they'd been upgraded a little bit in their literary uh, expression. So having to do the whole thing in-house, I had to learn photography as well. And so, you know... I, I bought a Pentax, a little Pentax, and I did all the photographs for the magazine. And gradually I became a photographer simply because this is what we had to do. Um, well, that's quite similar to what authors have to do now. Exactly. You know, to be self-published, they have to be their own marketing. They have to do that's everything right. themselves. And I think, you know, marketing has become, because I'm a neo-Luddite, I don't, you know, my, my daughter is a... a uh, published poet and and she has an enormous following on the internet I, I could probably you know try to do the same thing I, I just don't want to I, I feel I regard computers as the the enemy of our culture and the enemy of our civilization in many respects so how do you connect with your fans I don't oh. I don't uh, I don't I've been out of the uh, sort of um, I've been working on my own projects and working on my artworks for, for eight or nine years. So I've been just retired here. You know, this is a quiet place and, and uh, nobody can find me and I'm quite happy. Um, and other people are carrying on. The other point that, that, that I like to make is that I think my work in, in many areas has, that a lot of people have followed on from what I've done. So I feel happy. You know, if like the magazine, you know, 35 years later, something you started in 1980. Um, so I think I, I like the thought of, of commencing ideas and, and, and other people can take them up or run with them or do whatever. What would you say to a young author that's, that's looking to Good get luck. their books out? 
I <laughs> well, well, I think I think that uh, it's good to read uh, some of the books by the writers that you like. Like I think if you're emulating, and I, well, I'm an emulator, you know. I, I like to emulate a literary style or, or a style of presentation, like Mike Moore. Mike Moore's, you know, uh, one of my inspirations, I think, uh, because he has a way of, of putting things in his documentaries so strongly and so well, whether you like what he does or not. I think he, he's a great communicator. And, and whether you're a novelist or whether you're a non-fiction writer or whatever you're doing, you've got to be a good communicator. It doesn't matter whether you've got a handle on the truth. It doesn't matter whether you've got the real story. It matters whether anyone's going to read it. And that's a lesson that a lot of people don't seem to take on very readily. I think that's because, you know, in order to be a writer in the first place, we have to have a fairly developed ego. I think that's true. You know, like, why, why should the world give us stuff about what you think or what I think? Um, however, apart from that, um, I think, you know, you've got to be prepared to take some knocks. You've got to be prepared for people to say that what you're doing isn't going to work, etc. I've been through all that and I've ignored it and, and to my, you know, uh, benefit in the end. Um, but I do think that you, you need to develop a literary style and, you, and in order to do that, you need to read the, the people who are writing the sort of books you want to write. You know, like I go to my bookshop and I look for books that I would like to write or writers whose work coincides with where I'm thinking at the moment because they, they all have stylistic things to offer. So what I would say to a young aspiring author is how much have you read, what have you read, and how has that influenced you? And if that hasn't, then I would read a lot more in the influential sense. There's a book called Writing on the Right-Hand Side of the Brain, which I thought the, the brother of a book called uh, Drawing on the Left-Hand Side of the Brain. It, 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 it uh, sets out some really interesting uh, ways of conceptualizing your writing. I think it's one of the best. I don't. I don't think there's any instruction book I would recommend. Um, if, you, but if you're going to be talking to publishers, there's a book that's really essential, and it's Herb Sales' book. You can negotiate anything. It's about negotiation skills because if you're going to be a writer and you're going to be out there dealing with corporates, dealing with publishers, you're dealing with really. Um, very intelligent, very capable people who are going to do you down if they can. Uh, I joined the Australian Writers Guild. Um, they're worth joining because they, they have quite a lot of experience. They're not cheap. I like haven't been a member for a while. Um, I think it's like $80 a, or something. Hmm? $80 or something. Yeah, something like yeah. that. Uh, so I, th I think those sorts of things are useful. The, the other thing... I mean, why I write in longhand and why I do three drafts is a friend of mine who, who was a, a well-known playwright said to me once, I always do three drafts rather than type. I don't like typing and I don't like computers. And I said, why? And he said, well, if you're writing uh, your first draft and then you come back and you do your second draft, the third draft, whatever, you tend to leave things in rather than take them out. It's easier to get lazy. I'll leave that sentence in or I'll leave that bit in because it looks okay. If you're having to write it three times by hand, you will not leave in things that don't need. You will go over each sentence because as you write, you're looking at that sentence. And to me, that's been a gift that I've followed since I've ever started to write. And I hand letter. I don't write running writing. I hand letters so that anyone can read what I write. It, it's instantly legible to anyone. Um, now, I, I know that, you know, there's this picture of writers always at the typewriter or at the computer. Um, that's really good. But I know a lot of really famous and well-known writers still write by hand and they prefer that. So, and I think that also handwriting is a... A brain hand connection, you know, what you're doing here is creating a work of art, whether anyone sees it or not.
you know, it's beautiful. I like my writing to look beautiful. I don't like seeing mistakes and crossings out. I do drafts for that purpose. Um, so I think that in the end, to be able to look at the sheets of what you've written and, and be proud of how it's how it's written, not just what of what you've written, um, it's also something that gives me pleasure. And it may give other people pleasure if they haven't thought about it. Like most people have been programmed, most new writers, young writers, have been programmed to think that it's all got to be done on computer. And, and uh, you know, spell check's really great if you're illiterate. Uh, but I learnt to spell, I'm a really good speller. I, I've never needed to use spell check. So I think gradually our, our abilities and our, our, our necessity of having certain skills is diminishing because computers are making it easy for us. They're making it easy to do spell check, easy to lay out, easy, etc. Uh, I think the hard way is more interesting. <laughs> are you part of a writer's group? No. no. I, I, I haven't joined groups or you know, I've never joined a political organisation or only the organisations I, I, I've... Uh, been with with the owner builders people but that was very loose well, what are you working on now well what i'm working on now is uh, two things essentially I, i'm working on a sort of the 50 books that changed my life because i have you know these books that i my father read that i read that i learned from that philosophically changed my direction I found those to be pivotal and therefore I, I found I could write chapters on that basis and, and say what this book meant to me. Um, like for instance, uh, I read Henry Thoreau when I was a jackaroo in Western Queensland riding boundary fences and it was such a boring thing. You know, boundary fences are very boring. They go on for ages. What you're doing is repairing damages that the kangaroos or the emus might have made when they tried to get through it. Um, and I got lots of books and mail order. So I was reading the classics. In those days, you could, you could buy really cheap paperbacks of all the classics. And I, I realized I needed to develop a classical education. And, but then I, I read a review of Walden and I got Thoreau. And Thoreau just took me by incredible surprise. He, he, the one sentence that I read first, it said, the mass of people lead lives of quiet desperation. And I'm sitting here under a tree in the heat of the long reach sun thinking, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't want to do that. Um, my family are graziers. I was destined to be a, a grazing person and I left immediately. On the way, I picked up a copy of On the Road, Jack Kerouac's book. And On the Road introduced me to the idea of methadrine, which was freely available in chemists in those days. Um, not methamphetamine, <laughs> let's not go. But in methadrine, you, you, as long as you bought a toothbrush or something, you get a, a 25 pure pharmaceutical methadrine capsules for about 30 cents, which means you could have a party for 30 cents, you know, just <laughs> nobody eats with methadrine. Um, anyway, so Jack Kerouac introduced me to the idea of hitchhiking, really. Drugs and hitchhiking. And, and, and the, the idea. Great combination. <laughs> well, uh, he, he, Thoreau had, had set the philosophical point. You know, Thoreau had made the philosophical point that you don't need to be a materialist. You can go out in the world with, with your philosophy and live. You don't have to do anything at all, particularly. Um, but he taught me to think. And then Kerouac came along and, and here's this, you know, I'm a grazing boy. I went to boarding school, you know, in, 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 in traditional Queensland boarding school. And I had a traditional Queensland grazier's education. This was just so wildly exciting. And uh, I took off for Sydney pretty much at the age of 17. I, I grew my beard, I grew my hair long. I threw out all my clothes except the clothes I was wearing. And, and wandered off. And I, I slept the under bridges. Another I, I hippie. I slept under the harbour bridge with homeless <laughs> people. Um, and I used to eat at St Vincent de Paul. We used to call it the club. You know, St Vincent de Paul put on meals two, twice a day. Um, and uh, the, the, the homeless thing was fantastic. Uh, and during that time, I read George Orwell's Down and Out in London and Paris because I thought uh, I liked, uh, you know, Orwell's work. I liked Animal Farm. And um, so in my homeless period, and I also slept in the garden of the church at King's Cross, St. John's, because they locked the gates, you know, and the police couldn't get in to hassle you. And I used to sleep among the bushes and <laughs> wrapped in newspaper. Um, that was all a lot of fun. I thought it was a great adventure. 
and and nobody ever hurt me or harmed me or offered me any violence. Uh, I mean, I was I felt like I was protected. I was with a lot of dangerous people who were drinking methylated spirits and going nutty, um, and I just found all this fun. They were nice guys, nice people. Not many women there in those days. The other thing is, uh, I'm because I'm a diabetic. I have discovered that. Uh, many of the diabetic medications and many of the medis many of conventional medicines ideas about diabetes, including diabetes Australia, um, are, are not helping. They're not helpful. Uh, they may well be dangerous. They're certainly not helping the people who need that understanding of what their diet should be, what they should be doing, and what they shouldn't be doing. And the medications they're taking are not doing any help at all. So, I'm I'm working on. Uh, some pieces about diabetic education and how we can change that, how we can learn how to treat ourselves because there's a way out of diabetes without the drugs. There's a way out without the medications. And you're going to have a group as well? I'm starting a group. A real group. group. I'm starting a real group <laughs> called, based on, on the Alcoholics Anonymous idea that you sit around in a circle and say, I'm John and I'm diabetic. Um, but what you can share is how the treatment options that work for you because many of us have found outside the medical model of treatment that we can cure ourselves or we can at least diminish the effect that diabetes has on our lives. So we need to share that information and, and not just simply receive it from diabetic educators who have no idea what they're doing. When this book coming out? That's not a book, that's articles. This is articles? I, I mean, I, I pref well, some of my books have grown from articles. You know, I, the, the medical book, I wrote an article for The Independent. It was a five-page article, a long one of indicting modern medicine and, and then publishers said do you want to do something with that um, uh, I know I think look there are plenty of books on diabetes out there and I, I would rather do a, a, a internet based site right. which perhaps some other diabetic who's into computers will do for me because or, or that's why we're having a group I, I, I have one skill but I don't have the skill with the digital so someone will turn up I know that in my, my own experience, whatever you need in life. Uh, I didn't even think I'd end up here, you know, uh, in, at this stage in my life. But somehow whatever I've needed has come to me. And, and I'm confident that that will continue.